Welcome back to episode two of this video series on building a progressive web app using Coney Visualizer. I'm Billy Hollis, and in this video, we'll enhance the web app created in the first episode. We'll add searching, better responsive layout, and improved aesthetics. In the final episode, our finished web app will be promoted into a progressive web app. Our first improvement will be to add some simple searching capability. We will put a text box for that in a flex container along with the current drop-down for category right here. That way, we can get both widgets to resize in concert with each other as the page width changes. An easy way to create our flex container is to right-click on list categories and say that we would like to group it into a flex container. And of course, we should give it an appropriate name which in this case is something like FLX User Selections. By default, it takes up the entire page, so we do need to set some properties to get it to position appropriately. Let's do left at 15, top at 84, and we'll make the height 60. That's tall enough to hold the widgets that we're going to put in it. Oh, let's change that percentage to an absolute PX. At this point, we can no longer see the uh, drop-down that's inside of it, so we need to go there and fix some of its properties. In particular, we need to set its top to zero. And it will be nice to set its width to a percentage of the flex container now. We'll start with a 40% width for that. At this point, we're almost ready to put in the text box that will be used for searching, but there is one thing we need to do first. We need to tell the flex container that it needs to be horizontally. It needs to flow the elements in it horizontally. And now we can drag in a text box right there. And we'll put it right beside the drop down. We will be changing its properties to make it a little bit more precise in just a moment. Before we do that, though, let's change the name to TXT Search. So let's fix those properties for the text box. Go over to the Look tab there. We'll make the left 30. That will offset it 30 from the drop-down that's beside it. We'll set the width to be 30%. And I think it might be good for consistency to go back and set the, uh, set the width for this to 30% as well. I believe I set it at 40% earlier. Let's make that 30% instead. Now let's make the rest of the changes for that text box. Let's set the top to zero, and we'll also set the center Y to 50%. That will cause it to be centered within the flex container. We'll give it an overall height of 50, and we'll set the placeholder text to search. That's over on the text box tab right there. And finally, for consistency, let's go over to that drop-down and change his characteristics to match those of the text box, which means having a height of 50 and a center Y of 50%. To implement the search capability, we'll need a small JavaScript module. So let's go create one right here. And we'll name it application search module. Here's the code that goes in it. Let's drop it in right here and take a quick look. This JavaScript first checks to see if the search box has some text in it. And if it does, it filters the appliances down to those that have the search text in the description. Naturally, we could implement a more sophisticated search, but I'm keeping it simple in the interest of time. Notice the data fetched variable right here. It's used to hold the data that was returned in the original search, and it's also used to put back the data if there is nothing in the search box. To populate that variable, we need to capture it when it's first fetched. So go over to the form and to the on mapping action. This was created when we originally dragged the seg appliances onto the form. We need to highlight the callback when the data is returned, and then go to Add Snippet, right here. 
the snippet will paste in is very simple. It just captures the data fetched variable from the returned data. Now we need to make that JavaScript code in the module run when the user enters a search term. Since we are searching right in the app, we can do it every time the contents of the text box change. So we need to use the text boxes on text changed action. Let's go there and put in the logic that we need. We need to place the logic in a snippet, so let's add one. Go down to Add Snippet and drop in a single line. It's just a call to the JavaScript module we created earlier. It calls the code in that module to get matching appliances and put them in the list. Now we're ready to test the searching. As I did several times in the first episode, I'll start the build and then I'll skip ahead until it's done. As you can see, the build has been completed. Let's drag over a browser window with the finished application and let's paste in a search term such as stainless and we see that we restrict it down to just those appliances whose description includes the word stainless or we can change to white and get a different set of appliances. Now I've removed the browser and gone back to the main form and we can see that our current look is very plain. So now we're going to do some fit and finish work. First, we'll create a header with a logo and a company name for each page. First, I need to get my logo files into the application and they go in the resources directory. Let's navigate to that. Let me bring over a folder. And this is my area where I keep my workspaces. In the appliance app that we're working on right now, if we go to the appliance app resources common directory, we'll see a variety of resources that are used uh, in all Coney apps. They're automatically added. Let's add some images to that folder from a folder that I already have. Let's highlight two of these images and drop them into this common directory. Now those images are available for me to assign to the source of an image widget. So let's go back to Visualizer and that means we need to take our folders away. I'm going to put my header widgets in this area of the form. As before, I'll go ahead and create the widgets that are needed, which will be a flex container, an image, and a label, and then I'll show you how I configured them. And we're back with our top information in place. We have a flex container that holds the two pieces of information, a logo that is 60 by 60, and a label that is next to that. The flex container, of course, is set to flow horizontally. The image control has had its source property set to one of those logos that you saw a few moments ago, Hot Deals logo 192 PNG. There are lots of other cosmetic improvements that we can make. For example, these rows are a little bit tight. Let's loosen them up just a bit. To do that, go to the segment, and on the segment tab, you'll see the row height right here. Let's set that to 40. And that's not bad, but we do need for the labels to be centered within that particular space. So let's highlight the label and change his center Y to 50%. I'll do that with the other two labels as well. We can also make that list of appliances look better by changing the background of alternate rows to a slightly off-white color. Do that, let's go to the segment, the skin tab, and there is a special skin setting for alternate rows. And so we can enable that and then go to the background here and set that to something like, oh, 230, 230, 230, which is an off-white color. Now let's discuss skins for a moment. A skin is a set of property values that can be applied all at once. Also, all widgets that have the same skin applied are connected in the sense that changing some skin property values in one means that the change will work for all of them. I've created a few skins for this app to show you what I mean. 
These column headers, for example, need some cosmetic work. And rather than changing them all, I've created a skin with the look I want. And I'll assign that skin to all three. I've selected brand. So let me go to skins at the top here for the label skins. You'll see that I have one specially for column header labels. I'm going to assign that. And you see that instantly the appearance changes. Let me apply that same skin to the other two column headers. Now, when I change something about the skin for the price, such as perhaps the size, you'll notice that all three of the labels get that change. And if I change it back, that all three go back. To see how useful that can be, let's fix up the headers cosmetically. Let's make the background into something dark. And that will require me to make all of the labels a light color. To change that header area's background, we need to go to the flex header and go over to his background here. Let's make it a fairly light gray. And we need to bring the opacity up to 100 so that we can see it. Now we can barely see the labels, so let's highlight one and change the font color to white. And now our header area looks much better. I'll apply one more skin before we move on to talking about some responsive design capabilities. That skin is going to be for this label right here. And the name of it is right there, business name label skin. And so I assign that to the skin and we see that we get italic and we get a different foreground. I'll be adding a few more skins and cosmetic improvements to the app, but we've used enough time on that, so let's go on and talk about breakpoints. I'm back after making some of those cosmetic changes, the most obvious one being that I've changed the font to Verdana for most of the labels on this form. And now let's discuss breakpoints. For a form, if you look on this tab right here, you'll notice that the form has breakpoint settings that are reflected in the header up here. You see the little orange triangles that show where the breakpoints are. If we scroll over, you'll see the other breakpoints. Right now, we're using the breakpoint at 1024 for our basic layout. You can click on those breakpoint indicators to see what the design looks like at the various breakpoints. So for here, for example, we've gone back to 640 and we see what our layout looks there. It actually looks pretty good because it's a nice responsive layout. What we do notice at this size is that the drop-down and the search box are a bit small. Part of that is because we put a left of 20 there when really we wanted the flex container to do the positioning, so we've got a little bit more room, but they're too narrow. But we can fix that with something called breakpoint forking. Up at the top, we see this toggle. If we turn it on, now the changes that we make are only for the current size. So in that drop-down, we could make it with 40 or 45 for this size, and it gets bigger, and we'll do the same thing for the search box. It looks like the search box is a little bit over the edge, so we might want to bring that setting there, the separation between it and the drop-down, back to 20 for this size. Don't forget, though, to turn off breakpoint forking when you're finished working on a particular size. Otherwise, you might think that you're changing properties for all widths when you're really just changing them for one width. This layout looks pretty good, but of course, we need to build to see it in action. As usual, I'll start a build, and I will suspend the video until the build is finished. Our build has been completed, so now we can see a more responsive version of our app. Let's drag it over. And let's start reducing the width. And notice how at narrow widths, we get a more proportionate size for the search box and the drop down. Let's see it go back to the smaller size. As you can see, those two widgets now respond very gracefully to changes in the width of the form. 
And that's a demonstration of how breakpoint forking can help make your app very, very responsive. To save time, I'll make some additional minor cosmetic changes that I won't include in the video. These include making form backgrounds off-white so that other widgets stand out a bit better, some more use of breakpoint forking on the appliance detail page, and adding some subtle borders to the segment holding appliances. The final home screen will then look like this, with these changes giving the app appropriate production cosmetics. We'll be ready to go on to making the app a progressive web app in the last episode in this series, which is episode 3. I hope you've enjoyed seeing the app from episode 1 receive some significant improvements to get it closer to a production level app. There's still work to be done, but these two episodes should give you a good introduction to app building with Coney Visualizer. You can see additional resources at Coney Basecamp. Just go to the address on the screen. And I hope you return to the series for Episode 3.